And welcome back, everybody. You are watching The Cube, Silicon Angle TV's uh, premier video production, where we go out to the events, the top tech events, uh, to extract the signal from the noise from the smartest people at the show. Today, we're here at .com 2012, Splunk's annual user conference, uh, covering all the action. This is day two. Uh, my name is Jeff Kelly with Wikibon.org, and I'm joined with my co-host here, Jeff Frick from Silicon Angle. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome, everyone. We are excited. We've got a full day of lineup uh, of some great guests. Yesterday, the focus was on a lot of Splunk uh, executives. Today, we've got, I think, more customers, more partners, and some uh, other people in the community that are interested in big data. So we'd start our day off with Dan Woods. He's with CITO, CITO Research, sorry about that, and also a, con, uh, a frequent contributor to Forbes.com. So Dan, welcome to theCUBE, glad to have you on board. Glad to be here. So how have you enjoyed the show so far? You've got to walk around, see some interesting things. What has, uh, has struck you? I think it's been really interesting how uh, Splunk is doing a good job of expanding its, from its core market in IT to being relevant in different spaces. Um, one of the most interesting things I, I found was the idea of semantic logging. You know, Right now, Splunk is attacking all of these logs that are created by machines, whether it's web logs or whether it's uh, network logs. But now, uh, as time goes on, I think applications are going to be recognizing important events and then writing those to logs so that the, the logs will not be just about machine events, but they'll be about business events, customer interactions. And I think that, that Splunk is going to be very useful in using that. I think that's going to, that's going to be one uh, major trend. Um, I also think that it's really interesting to see how Splunk is usable as a policy engine or a monitoring engine to determine what's normal. One of the big themes at the security conference, I mean, at the security portion of the talk yesterday was how security can no longer be about detecting patterns of uh, viruses because the attacks are just too sophisticated and they don't have patterns anymore. They can conceal themselves really effectively. What they can't conceal is the unusual behavior that they uh, put forth doing their you know, malicious work. So if you have a really good understanding of what's normal in your environment, uh, you can then recognize when something abnormal is happening that might be a security risk. Well, what's normal in your environment? That's, it's very hard to kind of figure that out. Right. And by using Splunk, you can monitor all you know, hundreds of different little you know ranges that were normal, and notice if something strange is happening. So I think that that was another um, uh, uh, sort of uh, expansion of the use of Splunk that I, I found really interesting. Do you see that that trend in security in security companies? I mean, is that the way that they're changing the way that they sniff out and find security breaches? Absolutely. If you look at FireEye, um, they are pioneering a whole new way of uh, detecting threats by uh, basically creating a sandbox environment in which they can allow uh, something to operate. When they see what it does, they can tell whether it's a malicious thing or whether it's normal. And it's much different than um, uh, the, the kind of old model that is really broken of trying to detect threats through pattern matching, right. which, which just doesn't work anymore. Right, right. I noticed that in doing a little research before you came on that CITO Research, you're all about kind of teaching leadership in kind of the technical side of the house, where traditionally it's been more on the business side of the house. And we had Marquise on earlier, and he had an interesting uh, statement where the business people now can get information from the same data that he's watching as a security guy and, and glean some intelligence out of it and, and come up with some actionable things. So I think it is... It's a great theme I think you guys are latched onto that now there is more kind of business responsibility and leadership responsibility in what was traditionally kind of an IT role, let's just keep everything up and running and everybody happy. Can you talk a little bit about more, you know, kind of how you're seeing that trend and, and what you're doing to help these guys become kind of be better business leaders? Well, I think the first trend is, is uh, the trend that Splunk has um, uh, been working on for a while, which is operational intelligence. And the idea is that it's a gradual progression from using machine data for monitoring and operational purposes to understanding more high-level concepts that you, you, you can glean from that data to then understanding business-relevant you know, uh, uh, events in that data. And then finally, you know, having machine data, whether it's from operational sources or other sources, uh, become a part of uh, creating insights. And I think that it's IT that's going to be the one that understands the, all of the machine data sources. It's IT that's going to have to 
collect the questions that are relevant to answer, and then it's IT that's going to finally close the loop and say, here's the insight that we could gain. And so I think that if you look at the, the way a data center is run right now, you have all these independent systems there, um, that, that are doing various things, but then they're also you know, working together in a, in a highly uh, connected way. What is business going to be like in five years? It's going to be much more automated, more technology everywhere. It's going to look a lot more like a data center. And I think if we can actually get this right, uh, we can, uh, you know, teach the business a little bit more how to run these complicated environments. And I think, you know, things like Splunk are, are, are Swiss Army knives for, for making all this happen. That's an interesting point because, you know, we're seeing, especially in the marketing world, for instance, marketers and are quickly becoming uh, IT, or I should say technology buyers, as much as IT in a way. Um, so what is, it, what is it going to take, do you think, to kind of make that transition uh, where the business is more automated and the communication between the two, between IT and business, which has always been a struggle, uh, what's it going to take to make that transition so that the business can really take full advantage of what IT is capable of doing with tools like Splunk and other big data analytic tools that we're seeing hit the market? I think that, um, I have a pretty well-developed theory of this, and let me just try to summarize okay. it. Um, the big problem right now we have with technology leadership is that the footprint of technology is rapidly expanding, and it, we're losing control. You know, the, the IT function no longer has control because of cloud computing, mobile devices, consumerization, so they have less control than ever, but IT is still responsible for security, for uh, reliability, for disaster recovery, and so, uh, in addition, um, IT hasn't been really well managed in that we've done a reasonably good job of keeping things running, but do we know how much it all costs? Well, some, to some extent, and do we know what value it's providing? Very rarely. And so, if you ask somebody to prune the unimportant stuff, most people can't tell you what's unimportant, mm -hmm. you know, because there's no value accounting mm -hmm. in that. So, I think that the first thing IT does, IT needs to do, is to do a better job of managing itself. You know, be, uh, uh, show the value of what you're doing. Now the second thing I think IT needs to do is to reach out across that line and understand uh, what the business wants to do. Now how do you do that? That's, you know, mm -hmm. this is very difficult. I think a very simple way to do it is just to go around and ask the questions that would be most valuable to answer. Then that gives you the ammunition to say no to all of these things that come at you as an IT person. You get all of these technology choices, all these vendors. What is Apple most proud of? Apple is most proud of saying no. And so, what, in order to understand what an IT person should say no to, they have to understand what's important. And so, you know, closing that gap is the next. And once you have questions that are uh, worth answering, you can put a dollar value against those questions, and then the budget's no problem. You know, we can answer this question that would be worth a million dollars to answer for $20,000. That's a project that's approved right there. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, and, and right. so then um, I think it's also a question of, of having IT assert itself um, uh, and uh, uh, not play a role of uh, a second class executive. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have to realize that we alone can master this technology. You're not going to teach a, uh, a business person to be uh, an IT person, uh, to understand all the potential of the technology. Right. It's up to us to really to do that. And I'm going to turn my devices off now. <laughs> We're all connected all the time. Yeah. No worries at all. But, uh, some really good insights there. Um, so I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk, a bit, talk about Splunk kind of as a company and where they've come. Uh, from and where they are today and, and what you think they need to do to kind of continue on this momentum. They've obviously had a great year, uh, very successful IPO in April. Um, they had a great quarter, they just closed, um, you know, picking up I think over 400 new customers in the, in, in the quarter, I think 98 orders of 100,000 or more. So they're obviously uh, growing and really uh, kind of firing on all cylinders right now. But as you mentioned, uh, I believe you mentioned earlier, we're seeing a lot of use, new use cases being uh, developed by their customer base. They're starting in the uh, infrastructure area, in the, in the data center, but then they're moving to other areas. We heard a great anecdote yesterday about uh, analyzing elevator data yes. with Splunk. So we're seeing these different use cases, which is, which is very exciting, but also Splunk is now going to have to continue this, uh, their momentum while scaling to new use cases and to new, new areas. What do you think they need to do to kind of keep this going? Um, you know, as a, as a, company that's been you know, very successful so far, they've got uh, you know, a lot of really happy customers, but keeping that going as you grow can be a challenge for, for, for companies. What do you think they need to do? Well, I think that Splunk is sort of like Pearl. 
or Java or Python in that it is a platform for uh, doing many, many different things. And so in terms of going to market, you know, they have to go to market at the same time to the early adopters, which they're very successful right. and are enthusiastically adopted by, and, and, and startups especially are, are, are embrace Splunk. Then, of course, they have all the, you know, the apps that they're using to go in a targeted way and go off after the early majority and late majority by you know, solving specific problems. But how do they become what Godfrey Sullivan called the data fabric for not just the startups, not just the early adopters, mm -hmm. but for everybody else? And I think the key to that is, uh, first of all, this book that I, I was privileged to help uh, work on with, uh, there it goes, <laughs> uh, with uh, uh, David Carrasso, uh, solves one of the big problems that happens in these early majority accounts. And that is, people use Splunk to solve a certain problem and then they confuse the potential of Splunk with the path that they took to solve a certain problem. And so one of the reasons that we wrote this book is so that it would be easier to understand the entire big picture of Splunk, not just what you happen to do with it to solve your certain problem. Now once you do that, then all of a sudden, you start harvesting data and delivering it uh, uh, all over the place. We talked about one pattern, which was the establishing what's normal for security. But there's other patterns, like for marketing, for example. Is there a way that you can correlate two or three different you know, uh, marketing uh, event streams you know, uh, that are going into Eloqua or Marketo or something, but they don't exactly have an event you know, as wide an event recognition system, and maybe you can identify a really important marketing event that should be sent as a text to a salesperson. Well, you know, that's just a whole nother area of, uh, of, of sort of event processing in one vertical. And I think what's going to happen is that, you know, over time, maybe Marketo and Eloqua will do that. But there's all of this stuff you discover about what data can tell you uh, before it's been embedded in an application. Uh, I talked to the guys at MessageBus who, who were on SiliconANGLE earlier, and they explained how they are using Splunk as a policy engine to keep track of the best practices that you need to um, adhere to so that your mail gets accepted by the big mail senders. Mm -hmm. And so that shape of those policies is just crazy. You know, each, they've got four different spam, you know, four different collections of PhDs working to stop spam. <laughs> and each of them have a different set of rules. And those rules are constantly changing. And so your behavior as somebody who wants to send mail and have it received has to keep up with those. And they use Splunk as sort of like a first line of defense machine learning sort of knowledge capture device to do that. So you can see that here we've talked about business policy engines, we've talked about marketing events, we've talked about uh, uh, you know, the elevator example. So the, the, I think that you know, for Splunk to really get to where it needs to be, it needs to be inside these centers of excellence and not just one. It should be in the Business Process Management Center of Excellence. It should be in the Integration Center of Excellence. It should be in the Business Intelligence Center of Excellence. And so when Splunk learns how to tell its story to IT so that all of these people who are doing these, you know, these established functions now realize they have a much more valuable way of doing it, I think that will, then people will start understanding that generic operational intelligence message that Splunk has been uh, trying to send. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. It, it's just wild to me that here we are in 2012 and you know, one of the key attributes to help this company be successful is a book. Um, right. <laughs> right. But, it's a, but it's a new way to do a book. It's, as uh, David talked about yesterday, it's, it's you know, being publishing on demand, it's being able to update it, it's being able to have free electronic versions that are distributed lots of different ways, but, but at the end of the day it's still a book. Uh, as still a great way to get information across, to give examples, to let people really tap into the power of what Splunk is delivering. And uh, it, it just sounds like you know, we're just right at the tip of the iceberg as to where businesses could continue to extract value from their data via Splunk. Yeah, I think that the, you know, the interest, we've done more than 25 books you know, uh, at CITO Research. Uh, on all sorts of topics from wikis, we did wikis for dummies, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, uh, Lost in Translation, which is about IT alignment. And uh, uh, our most recent one was um, API's A Strategy Guide uh, that was published by O'Reilly. Uh, and uh, the, the thing about it is, it's important not to confuse the form of the thing with the purpose of the thing. Mm -hmm. The form of this is a book, it's got pages. Of course, it could be delivered on a Kindle, 
But the purpose is to collect a bunch of knowledge and then to stream it out in an easily digestible form. That's what a book is. Right. You know, and so will we always need to collect a bunch of knowledge and then make it palatable to certain audiences? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's never going to go out of style. Yeah. You know? yeah. That's great. That's great. Thanks a lot. So we are here at Splunk's Conf 2012. It's a humid day. It's not, the, it's not the dry heat in Las Vegas that they usually talk about. We've got about 80% humidity uh, as, the, as the flood waters evaporate into the air. I'm here with Jeff Kelly. We're here with Dan Woods from CITO Research. Uh, again, uh, also contributes to Forbes. Day two of the Splunk conference coming to you from the Cube. Again, at siliconangle.tv, a premier video broadcasting service where we do go out to the events. We talk to the people you want to uh, hear from. We get the information you want to hear. And, and do it in a nice way. Do it in a conversational way. Get right to the right to the information, it's not a press release. So we're really happy to have you. We've got a full day lined up. We've got another guest uh, getting mic'd up over there with the crew. So we will take a short break and be back in just a few minutes. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dan.